monitoring and adverse effects. What complications or adverse effects can occur from nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and hyperemesis gravidarum and what are their preventive and management strategies? Urea and serum electrolyte levels should be checked daily in women requiring intravenous fluids, histamine H2 receptor antagonist or proton pump inhibitors may be used for women developing gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophagitis, or gastritis. Thiamine supplementation, either oral or intravenous, should be given to all women admitted with prolonged vomiting, especially before administration of dextrose or parenteral nutrition. Women admitted with HG should be offered thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin unless there are specific contraindications such as active bleeding. Thromboprophylaxis can be discontinued upon discharge. Women with previous or current nausea and vomiting of pregnancy or hyperemesis gravidarum should consider avoiding iron-containing preparations if this exacerbates the symptoms. In women requiring intravenous fluids, Daily monitoring of fluid and serum electrolyte levels is important to prevent and treat hyponatremia and hypokalemia. Recurrent intractable vomiting may lead to gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophagitis, or gastritis. Esophageal gastroduodenoscopy is safe in pregnancy and indicated if there is hematemesis or severe epigastric pain. A therapeutic trial with a proton pump inhibitor is appropriate for treatment and prevention and is safe in pregnancy. Wernicke's encephalopathy due to vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency classically presents with blurred vision, unsteadiness and confusion, memory problems, drowsiness, and on examination, there is usually nystagmus, ophthalmopigia, hyporeflexia or areflexia, gait, and or finger-nose ataxia. In hyperemesis gravidarum, the presentation tends to be episodic and of slow onset. Wernicke's encephalopathy is a potentially fatal but reversible medical emergency. In hyperemesis gravidarum, the presentation tends to be episodic and of slow onset. Wernicke's encephalopathy is a potentially fatal but reversible medical emergency. In the context of hyperemesis gravidarum, it is totally preventable and studies have stressed the association between Wernicke's encephalopathy and administration of intravenous dextrose and parenteral nutrition. One of these studies reported that complete remission occurred in only 29% and permanent residual impairment was common. The overall pregnancy loss rate including intrauterine deaths and termination was 48%. Therefore, thiamine supplementation is recommended for all women with protracted vomiting. A retrospective study found that the odds ratio for venous thromboembolism with hyperemesis gravidarum was 2.5 or 95%. However, since women with hyperemesis gravidarum are only at markedly increased risk while persistently vomiting, thromboprophylaxis can be discontinued at discharge or when the hyperemesis gravidarum resolves. Oral iron can cause nausea and vomiting. In a Canadian prospective cohort study, two-thirds of 97 women who discontinued iron supplements reported improvement in their severity of nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. Further Management What is the role of the multidisciplinary team? In women with severe NVP or HG, input may be required from other professionals such as midwives, nurses, dietitians, pharmacists, endocrinologists, nutritionists, and gastroenterologists and a mental health team including a psychiatrist. There are many facets to severe NVP or HG and a holistic approach to assessment and treatment should be adopted. 
Dietetic advice can be very helpful to treat or avoid potentially serious complications. Women requiring enteral or parenteral feeding require input from a gastroenterologist and a nutritionist. Involvement of a mental health team in the woman's care may improve quality of life and the ability to cope with pregnancy. Emotional support in psychological or psychiatric care may be required with targeted interventions specifically designed to treat mental health issues in hyper-MSS gravidarum, which are a result of hyper-MSS gravidarum or HG rather than a cause. When should enteral and parenteral nutrition be considered and what are the risks to the mother and fetus? When all other medical therapies have failed, enteral or parenteral treatment should be considered with a multidisciplinary approach. There are no defined criteria for parenteral or enteral feeding. Their effectiveness is not well established. Anecdotally, they can be successful and are often employed as a last resort when all other medical therapy has failed and the only other practical option is termination of the pregnancy. Close monitoring of metabolic and electrolyte balance, related complications and nutritional requirements are needed so a multidisciplinary approach can be employed. Enteral feeding options to consider include nasogastric, nasodudinal, or nasojejunal tubes, or percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, or jejunostomy feeding. Parenteral feeding with a peripherally inserted central catheter, or PICC line, is often better tolerated than enteral feeding However, it carries a higher risk of infection and vascular perforation. There may be a resistance to enteral feeding from the patient for cosmetic and psychological reasons or fear of discomfort. However, it is more effective and safer than parenteral feeding. In some women, intragastric feeding by nasogastric or percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube increases the risk of nausea and vomiting. It may be tolerated in the short term but not in protracted hyperemesis gravidarum. In nasojejunal feeding, the tube is inserted endoscopically to the jejunum and feeding can be administered by a continuous infusion. One study showed that although the majority of women improve greatly within 48 hours, Ongoing vomiting and retching can dislodge gastric and post-pyloric feeding tubes. Feeding via a percutaneous endoscopic gastrojejunostomy placed under general anesthetic in the second trimester has been shown to be an effective, safe, and well-tolerated treatment of hyperemesis gravidarum. In the majority of women, the tube is removed after delivery. The risk of early dislodgement is minimized compared with nasoenteric placement. Potential complications of percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy include tube dislodgement, obstruction or migration, cutaneous or intraabdominal abscesses, fistula formation, pneumatosis, occlusion, and intestinal ischemia. Total parenteral nutrition is a complex high-risk intervention However, it may be useful in refractory cases to ensure sufficient calorie intake. It should only be used as a last resort when all other treatments have failed, as it is inconvenient, expensive, and can be associated with serious complications such as thrombosis, metabolic disturbances, and infection. A strict protocol with careful monitoring is essential when undertaking total parenteral nutrition. When should termination of pregnancy be considered? All therapeutic measures should have been tried before offering termination of a wanted pregnancy. The hyper Education and Research, or HER Foundation in the USA, reports that 10% of pregnancies complicated by hyper gravidarum and in termination in women who would not otherwise have chosen this. Pregnancy Sickness Support in the UK 
found that many of these women have not been offered the full range of treatments available and fewer than 10% have been offered steroids. Treatment options of antiemetics, corticosteroids, enteral and parenteral feeding, and correction of electrolyte or metabolic disturbances should be considered before deciding that the only option is termination of the pregnancy. A psychiatric opinion should also be sought, and the decision for termination needs to be multidisciplinary with documentation of therapeutic failure if this is the reason for the termination. Women should be offered counseling before and after a decision of pregnancy termination is made. In a survey of 808 women who terminated their pregnancies secondary to hyperemesis gravidarum, 123 or 15.2% had at least one termination due to HG and 49, 6.1% had multiple terminations. Prominent reasons given for the terminations were inability to care for the family and self, 66.7%, fear that they or their baby could die, 51.2%, or that the baby would be abnormal, 22%. Discharge and follow-up. What discharge and follow-up arrangements should be implemented? Women with nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and hyperemesis gravidarum should have an individualized management plan in place when they are discharged from hospital. Women with severe NVP or HG who have continued symptoms into the late second or the third trimester should be offered serial scans to monitor fetal growth. At the time of discharge, it is essential that women are advised to continue with their antiemetics where appropriate and that they know how to access further care if their symptoms and or signs recur, for example, persistent vomiting, dehydration, or ketonuria. Earlier treatment may reduce the need for hospital admission. Rehydration and a review of antiemetic treatment should ideally be undertaken in an ambulatory daycare setting. Better communication and advice about the safety of antiemetics may enable general practitioners to adequately support women with hyperemesis gravidarum. A follow-up appointment for antenatal care is important in women suffering from HG. Psychological and social support should be organized depending upon the clinical and social circumstances. An observational study has shown that women with HG and low pregnancy weight gain less than 7 kilograms during pregnancy, are at an increased risk of preterm delivery and low birth weight. When women with severe HG are considered, it has been shown that those requiring repeated admissions have an 18% incidence of small for gestational aged babies and significantly lower birth weights than babies of women with HG and single admissions. What is the effect of nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and hyperemesis gravidarum in the postnatal period? How should we advise about future pregnancies? Women with previous HG should be advised that there is a risk of recurrence in future pregnancies. Early use of lifestyle or dietary modifications and antiemetics that were found to be useful in the index pregnancy is advisable to reduce the risk of NVP and HG in the current pregnancy. Women who have experienced severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy in a previous pregnancy may benefit from initiating dietary and lifestyle changes and commencing antiemetics before or immediately at the start of symptoms in a subsequent pregnancy. A small randomized study in women with previous NVP demonstrated that preemptive treatment with antiemetics resulted in fewer women with moderate to severe NVP. What is the effect of nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and hyperemesis gravidarum on quality of life? A woman's quality of life can be adversely affected by NVP and HG and practitioners should address the severity 
of a woman's symptoms in relation to her quality of life and social situation. Practitioners should assess a woman's mental health status during the pregnancy and postnatally and refer for psychological support if necessary. Women should be referred to sources of psychosocial support. Practitioners should validate the woman's physical symptoms and psychological distress. Women should be advised to rest as required to alleviate symptoms. NVP has been reported to reduce quality of life, impairing a woman's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis, and negatively affects relationships with her partner and family. Women with HG are 3 to 6 times more likely than women with NVP to have low quality of life. Persistent nausea is a symptom that most adversely affects quality of life. It has been recommended that social support is necessary as an adjunct to treatment and the circle of support should be expanded to include family, friends, and healthcare professionals. A cohort study of 648 women found that having support from at least three other persons was protective for NVP. Clinical assessment should be considered for depression and postnatal depression with appropriate referral. Depression and poor psychological health were found to be associated with NVP and HG in numerous studies but resulted from the disease and were not the cause of HG or NVP. Measures that address NVP, poor social support, and depression are warranted throughout pregnancy. Poor psychological health of women with hyperemesis gravidarum is considered as the demoralization of suffering from a prolonged, severe chronic illness, and in this regard, it is similar to mental health problems suffered in other chronic illnesses. Fatigue is associated in NVP in several studies. Rest, particularly napping, is reported by women to relieve symptoms. A survey of 114 women conducted by a volunteer from Pregnancy Sickness Support found that rest was noted by the majority of respondents with hyperemesis gravidarum as being the only effective management strategy aside from antiemetics. Any kind of sensory stimulation can trigger symptoms, so complete removal from sources of stimulation may be necessary. Appendix number 2. Pregnancy Unique Quantification of Emesis Index or PUQE Index. Appendix number 3. Recommended antiemetic therapies and dosages. Appendix number 4. Treatment algorithm for NVP or nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and HG or hyperemesis gravidarum. 